at Cherry Street, which is now um, the function no longer is. Um, if you can take a look by the next slide, uh, already by 1871, the New York Times was writing articles about our society and about its, in this case, third annual gala, in which they, uh, well, you know, kind of maybe perhaps a bit condescendingly referred to the Spanish ladies as spirited and graceful dancers, which I imagine for the time was fine, uh, it could have been worse. Um, so, you know, for about 20 or 30 years, we actually had kind of a quiet existence. We had about 130 members, increased by maybe 10% every year. The Spanish immigrant community was always quite small. Um, when you compare it to the Italian Americans, for example, they outnumber 75 to 1. Irish immigrants, almost the same. Um, even Portuguese, which is just a sliver of what is Iberia, outnumbered us 5 to 1 here. So Spaniards, people of Spanish descent, were very few. Um, now, that said, it might have been quiet, but something happened in 1898, which I'm sure we all know, and it was called the Spanish-American War. And as you can imagine, um, for Spaniards in this neighborhood, and particularly at the society, who very much wanted to integrate into the American culture, and very much felt American, uh, it was a very, very difficult time. And there are stories of people who really had their loyalties split, as you can imagine. Um, that said, uh, you can see, if you go back one more second, uh, we had a lot uh, uh, to stack up against us, uh, as witnessed by this uh, Pulitzer uh, article, uh, the cartoon. Uh, the Hearst and Pulitzer magazines made, made a effort at uh, a lot of anti-Spanish sentiment at the time. So again, it was not easy for us here at the society. In fact, if you can see now from the next slide, uh, and to give you an idea of the prominence that the society was starting to uh, obtain at the time, uh, it, as, the, as the war had just ended, about $400 was collected here for the uh, prisoners of war in Washington, D.C. And our president at the time went down to Washington and uh, provided aid for the Spanish uh, admiral at the time. And it seemed like a perfectly rational thing to do after the war, but as you can see by the title, uh, there was a suggestion that our president be brought up on treason. So, uh, and, uh, as you can imagine, uh, those were tough times. But we got over them. And it leads me to this interesting slide. Right after the war ended, there was a, there was a real boom in, uh, in everything Spain. And uh, it was viewed as this exotic country, and all of a sudden in New York City popped up a lot of Spanish institutions. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Hispanic Society of America. Yeah. Did you have a program there, maybe? Okay, it's an absolute gem. And uh, I think sometimes I blame us Spaniards uh, for not promoting ourselves as good as say French, because uh, to have such a, a, a gem of there is not enough people talk about it. But uh, that, uh, that's there. The uh, Columbia University in 1900 also uh, opened up the, the Casa de España, which is still there. And um, this gentleman, Jose Cambrubé, started a newspaper called La Prensa, known today as uh, El Diario. El Diario is the number one selling Spanish language newspaper in the United States of America. So it so happens to be that this individual of Catalan origin also was president of the society. And he used uh, his position in the newspaper to try to unify Spaniards for uh, political clout, for economic reasons. And the society that he created, so it's the La Nacional, remember it's the La Nacional from 1868, he created the Union Benefica Española. And in his articles, discussed about all the clubs coming together. And as you see in the next uh, article, You'll see in the corner, la Unión Benefica Española abre su suscripción para las reformas de su local, which basically means that he started a program where uh, people will start to donate for uh, renovations to its brand new building that they purchased right here in what was becoming Little Spain. And so that was, uh, and, and at the same time, La Nacional, what we know as La Nacional Spanish Benefic Society, joined with the Unión and for other groups, it was actually a good 10 other groups that decided to join and they brought their own house that thankfully we still have today, right? 
Uh, at the time, there were uh, what we like to say cradle to the grave services. And uh, even at St. Vincent's Hospital, uh, of course, which closed, I'm not sure you were not happy about that, because neither would we, uh, we had a wing in the hospital dedicated to our members, which was very common at the time. And um, so when they fell ill or when they were born, uh, whatever it took, we provided the services for them through our own doctors. And of course, when I say to the grave, we, to this day, own about five or six big cemetery plots located throughout uh, Brooklyn and Queens, where our members, and sometimes people who are not our members, but just the destitute, uh, we will bury them with their fellow countrymen, and we'll take a look at some of them. There's a picture from the 40s. I recently went uh, uh, and took a picture of all of them about five years ago. And you can see they're quite beautiful with the names of everybody all together. And you know, if you die without a family member, of course, at least it'd be nice to be buried in a place where there's some dignity. Um, and uh, the society at that time, uh, with company's help, uh, opened up about seven or eight different branches of the society in different states throughout the Union. And uh, you can take a look at some. Okay. And then, of course, let's talk a little bit about 14th Street itself. Here's a photo from about the 1920s. You can see the Guadalupe Church right here. Okay, uh, and the Guadalupe Church uh, was created by a lot of people who are our members with their own hands, brick by brick. And it's done very much in the Spanish style, the Spanish style. And uh, they converted a brownstone into a, uh, a church. And if anyone has ever had the uh, opportunity to go visit that, that's quite nice too. Unfortunately, it is now decommissioned and it has moved over to 8th Avenue. In fact, we are constantly in talks with them asking them that if the church ever is going to sell, to please give us the opportunity to buy it, because otherwise it is not protected by landmarks law, which is a shame. And um, if a developer purchases it, you will see it raised very quickly. So we always ask the church, if you sell, please come to us. Well, take a look. This is next door. And you can see how beautiful the uh, brownstones were at the time. Uh, the entire block looked just like this. Uh, there's Guadalupe from the front. And going back to Cradle the Grave, of course, when it came to another important rite of passage, weddings uh, that would take place uh, right next door to Guadalupe, and, uh, and then they would have their um, party here at the society. And here's just a couple other institutions that were starting to uh, grow on 14th Street, other Spanish ones. You see in the left corner, the Casa Maria. It was basically a home for uh, immigrants that first arrived, and they allowed them for short term stays. Uh, it uh, became the Tepeyac Society, uh, the Mexican Tepeyac Society, which you and unfortunately that closed. Uh, over here you see Oviedo Bar and Restaurant. I don't know if any of you remember it. It was an institution for about 50 years. Um, and then, unfortunately, blocked by the truck is Casa Moneo. Now, Casa Moneo was a true institution on this block around almost 100 years. Um, everybody who ever walked onto this block always knew about Casa Moneo, and unfortunately, after about four generations, the latest generation didn't want to no longer they could go to the store, and it closed in <coughs> 1990. And that was uh, that, that hurt. And here is something uh, dear to us at the society. This is uh, our vice president, who is here, but Max Vasquez. Um, this is his father, and his father owned La Iberia and he always loves to tell stories. Max is probably the only person left on the block that was born, he's about 65 now. He was born here and plans to live the rest of his life here. And uh, that's his father. And he tells a lot of the stories of when he was a kid, literally these sailors would come off uh, the ships and not even know the first thing, imagine what life was for them. And uh, he, his father should have offered them a student and say, yes, back when can. And that was very typical. Uh, here it comes to another uh, difficult period for Spaniards here in the city, and that was the Spanish Civil War. Um, as you may know, the Spanish Civil War is actually a very uh, written about war. It's simply told me it's the second most written about war, even in the English language, because it is a war, it's a civil war not based on what traditionally you think it would be, perhaps a land grab, perhaps a religious divide, uh, 
um, economic reasons. It is a bullshit between conservatives and liberals. I'm the reason. And, um, and people who are best of friends were no longer able, were no, could no longer talk. And it happened here, even at the society. Now, of course, it was mostly in fashion to be anti Franco. Not everybody was. In fact, Casamoneo himself was a big supporter of the conservative side. And as you can see, here are some of our members in front of their store telling them, please do not buy fascist merchandise. And to give you an idea, even the Guadalupe Church put up a huge banner saying, do not support communists. So um, it was an interesting time indeed. Now, on the other side, uh, there was many, many, and in fact, majority who were pro-Republic. And here you see at the Manhattan Center a bunch of standards. And of course, one of our sister clubs uh, had a uh, anti-fascist Okay, but that came to an end as well, and we enjoyed what was clearly our golden period. Uh, we had about 6,000 or 7,000 members soon after the Spanish Civil War. A lot of Spaniards had come here to escape the dictatorship, and um, and there was just it was a rip roaring time here. It really was, and at that point there was over 50 establishments on this block. So basically, every storefront you see today was a Spanish-owned business or a club. Uh, of course, the Nacional was always at the center of it. And one of the reasons is why, if anyone's ever been to Spain, it's a place that generally tends to think of its region first, and then the country second. So, of course, many of the clubs were the Zaragozano, the Bilbaina, um, the Café Madrid. Uh, so, uh, we were the only club that was called La Nacional, which basically said, okay, as we started to grow, we could no longer have our parties here rent some of the uh, uh, hotels in the city for our annual gallons. There's a couple other pictures. And here's some more that took place here in society. And as you see, our staff of cooks working diligently downstairs to provide for everyone. Of course, we gave Spanish classes. So uh, immigrants, uh, I do with my own children, even though we consider ourselves American first and foremost, we don't want to use the Spanish language. And of course, a lot of Spanish immigrants felt the same way, so we offered Spanish classes and still do to members. And here is an interesting uh, committee of uh, Spaniards here at the society that were trying to increase the small amount of Spaniards that were actually coming here. It was a committee formed to increase the quota that the United States was allowing in. As you see in the picture of Frank Roosevelt on the top, that picture is still upstairs in our office, it's never been touched. The Franklin Roosevelt family actually was very close with us. Eleanor Roosevelt had come here and had donated money. And just about three months ago, we had a nice sit-down dinner with his grandchildren. So, and who are uh, one of the married Spanish chiefs here. So we consider ourselves you know, connected to that family. So as part of that golden age, we uh, had a beautiful representation. I don't know if anyone remembered the uh, 1964 uh, World's Fair, but the Spanish Pavilion was a big star. And uh, as you can see, some of our members signed up to be hosts. And this was really great. So imagine, we were so big at the time that most of the, many of our members, I mean, the president of Liberia, New York, was our member. Uh, a lot of the pilots. So every August, which is traditionally the uh, month where Spaniards have their vacation, we would get four chartered flights and have all our members uh, return to Spain and come back in September, just like they and I love this photo, it just really shows the uh, golden age of, of flight when everyone dressed up. And it's just so, it's just such a beautiful picture, you know. Uh, by here, as you can see by the tacky decor, we're entering the 70s. Uh, and here is a um, dance of traditional region of Galicia, which we will talk about a little bit more up the next slide. And I don't know if anybody remembers, but we used to close the street down for an entire weekend, not like it was now, but the entire weekend it would close and all the restaurants would bring out their um, seats and their chairs and where they would, we would have festival that lasted the whole weekend. Very much reminding of Spain, we would have dancing, we would have fake bullfighting, you name it, we had it. Um, I go back to that other slide. 
Yeah, as you can see, who the mayor was at the time, so that was Mayor Beam. So probably about the early 70s, uh, the mayor's the tradition come here. Okay. And as most Spanish festivals are, it's a mix of partying, a little bit with the required religious procession. In this case, uh, it looks like a, the St. James the Warrior. And colorful uh, outfits. And of course, there's the national in the background, and uh, some of the VIPs would always be a little extra donation to see on Friday for some of the uh, this is something we really love. So I don't know if anyone was able to take a look at some of the uh, archives in the front, but one of the true gems that we have here, and thankfully we do a lot of things that we lost over time, is we have all the membership cards of everyone who's ever became a member here. And they are so lovely, and every immigrant group uh, around always asks us for them, and we're really proud to have them. And they really kind of colonize all the Spaniards who have ever had, uh, come through these through the street of the society. And we'll take a look at a few. And I have something in particular, really something that we're plugging into. Oh, I guess Ramiro was reminding me that we get people that come in all the time and ask us, please, we'd like to research a family member that had to come in here. People who have long lost the Spanish language, long lost their connection with Spain. But maybe somebody says, you know, I know somebody that came in here. And when they find their card of their, of their first ancestor that came here with their photo, it's just it's really a beautiful moment. So let's take a look at a few. You could just look how beautiful they are, you know? And it really gives a lot of detailed information, uh, you know, where she was born, of course, in Spain, uh, what province, what age, the year she was inscribed up on top in 1954. This is Maria Gomez. Uh, it, it would tell where she was, uh, her father, her mother. So it really gave a background for you to explore your family. And um, of course, on the, on the bottom, we would have uh, other observations. Um, you know, I, I really like some of the details they put on. So we really randomly chose these, which is really a real laughing moment. So uh, this will, let's keep going for a few others. I love this one. This one's right out of the movie. Uh, right, gangster movie. Uh, and OK, guys, this is something that this has happened to me 10 minutes ago, or right before, 10 minutes before this presentation. We, there are probably 5,000 of these cards upstairs, maybe more. We completely randomly chose these cards. Completely random. I think we chose this one because that kid is really cute. Okay? And it also is kind of interesting since a lot of the, the members early on were not just Spaniards, but they were, in this particular case, Cubans, which we had many. Of course, in this case, he was uh, uh, born in Cuba to a mother who was Cuban and a father who was Spanish. His name is Secondly. Well, about 10 minutes ago, somebody just introduced themselves. I've never met him in my life. Right in the middle of this car. Second, Dino, will you stand up? There he is. Okay. I had absolutely no idea he was coming. I have never met him before in my life. And the fact that he is here is really, really astonishing. Uh, uh, just a couple others. It really gives you a little bit of history. If you see Baja, means when they either left the club or in this case, Valle, you know, it means he passed away. Uh, our club also had a lot of people, I think, of Spanish American descent, as you see when this club would be born in the USA. This is a typical sailor. Uh, as you see by his profession, that was probably the majority of people that came in from the stores. Uh, it tells you about the bottom where his father lived. Uh, you know. And then, of course, I know it's not quite as romantic, but our modern day cards. Uh, Chevalier is a lovely member who might be here now, and uh, a Spanish actress. Uh, but lo and behold, do not worry, we keep all the same information just in our computer now. Uh, this is something really special. Uh, 50 years ago, uh, we, I think it's this year, we will be celebrating this society founded what is known as Dia de la Hispanidad, the Hispanic Day Parade. Now, uh, for anyone here of Spanish descent, if you are Spanish American like myself, it's kind of strange in some ways. We uh, very much are white Europeans, you know? But at the same time, we very much identify ourselves with other Latino groups, and proudly so. And my father, who is here, uh, always told me um, that uh, if anyone ever says anything about a Puerto Rican or Cuban or anything,
can have, take it as the same offense as they were saying something about Spanish. Because it's 500 million people who share our language, our culture, our, our customs, our surnames. And this society takes great pride in that. And uh, one of the things that we are very, very proud to have founded was this parade. So we march up Fifth Avenue the day before Columbus Day. And I can say this without being uh, biased because I married an Italian-American wife who is also here. Uh, and my kids are uh, half Italians, um, half Italian descent. But we Spaniards laugh a bit when uh, we see that for some reason Columbus Day is celebrated as an Italian holiday. Because, of course, as I like to tell people, imagine uh, for whatever reason it was found out that Neil Armstrong may or may not have been born in, let's say, France or England. But for some reason, 500 years later, with, of course, American technology, uh, it is now celebrated as a French or English holiday, not an American one. That's kind of how we feel. So anyway, um, as you can see, here's a picture from the 70s. Uh, representations of the boat. I think the Italians used the same float the next day. <laughs> um, the, uh, here's a picture from 1975. And this one we love too because the man on the far left is Francisco Santa Maria, who is our oldest member today, about age maybe 85. And we're going to see another slide of him very soon. As you see today, it's getting a little bit bigger. You know, it was always very, very much ignored compared to the Italian parade. But I think people are starting to realize what we've always known that it is a day to really celebrate the Hispanic race. We're not talking about Spaniards, we're not talking about natives, we're talking about everybody. We're talking about that new race that was created for better or for worse, for better or bad, uh, and that's the Hispanic race. And that's who celebrates that particular day. And I will tell you something. Uh, uh, Spaniards, I, maybe we could say at times, have a complicated relationship with, with uh, other Spanish-speaking people. I think in general we do, but that's one day that when Art Float, who leads the parade, walks down, we get a lot of people kissing all of us. Uh, Madre Patria, which means mother country. So, you know, there's also a lot of goodwill. Uh, hopefully this parade will continue that. Okay, here is, uh, before the parade, there's the Spanish consulate. As you see, my lovely ladies from Dance Flamingo here. This is some of our present board, and far left, once again, is Mr. Francisco Santa Maria, who we had seen in the slide prior. Uh, there's the uh, coat of arms presenting the different flags of the Spanish Indian nations. That's a lovely photo in front of um, Saxby's Avenue. And of course, let's get back to the region of Galicia, which is a region that actually my uh, uh, descendants come from. And it is a region, Galicia is uh, the word Gaelic. And uh, as you can see, uh, Spain is a very complicated country. It's not just bullfighting and flamenco, I promise you. And uh, this particular region of Spain uh, has at least lays claim to uh, the bagpipe for the Irish have. We won't get into that for you Irish. Um, but anyway, uh, nonetheless, about five or six of those groups are actually represented on St. Patrick's Day. So uh, as a part of the Celtic nation. Uh, so those are the uh, Spanish from that region. Uh, a couple more photos. Uh, we also, um, we, any Betty that wants to come from Spain, uh, we open our doors too, and many times it's a, uh, a lot of groups from Spain, from uh, musicians, uh, bands, and even the uh, Spanish police uh, have come to march down with us in that parade. It's always very funny to see camaraderie between the Spanish police and the New York police, and they're really, they march together, and it's kind of interesting. Here, uh, of course, it was the time after a really big moment here for all of us sufferers of the World Cup. The year after she came on the World Cup. I don't think we are not big on our flag, uh, but this is a kind of a Spanish thing, but we, uh, we are very proud to present it that year. And of course, afterwards, we host a beautiful party here where we invite all the consulates of every Spanish speaking nation for a, and we have a dinner for them with our food from the restaurant downstairs. And now we're coming a little bit to where we are today. As I've told you, well, let's get into this first. Uh, this line, yeah, you can go to the next one. This line is a, uh, a line that actually extends to 7th Avenue up 15th Street. Okay? Because this is the line to get in for the final of the World Cup. Okay? And if I could have told you the stress on all of us that day, because when you literally have people crying to get in, 
And we really believe in not charging for things, but to give you an idea, they started to notice people walk in, our members, because members always have. And uh, a lot of people are like, well, why are they walking in? And I said, well, they're members. So all of a sudden, people like, well, I'd like to become a member. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the little light bulb went off, and I said, well, that's true. Uh, if anyone would like to sign up, it's a yearly fee of $100. We signed up 67 people in about one hour to get in. Uh, most of them never became members the next year, but. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, that was a, a really special, special uh, This is not the final because I want the buildings would never want to come in to see how many people were in that day. That's a little bit of uh, the celebration downstairs in the restaurant. And of course, this is a, gets back a little bit to what, how we celebrate uh, some of our events. So we have our annual members party. It's an excuse to come and pay your annual order. And in return, we will give three or four meals where everything is free for, you, for our members and their families if they want to make up their money. There's a couple of uh, pictures of it. Uh, we host musicians that come from Spain all the time. Uh, next. Like, that's right, Ramiro, who is uh, a, a really well-known actor, I should let you know, reminded me about the true commitment that we have to uh, uh, cultural exchange here. Um, we take great pride in offering our space very, very cheap. It's not always easy to pay the bills, but uh, we give our space in the name of culture. Uh, not just the Spaniards, by the way, we, uh, and Spanish speakers, but you know, when the anti fan group is here, or unions come, our space is always open. Uh, we have networking parties for all the young Spaniards that come. We don't have, uh, the Spaniards who come are not like they did when the sailors and the workers came. Now we have people who are accountants and, and architects, and people who are really qualified, but maybe not finding the work that they should find in Spain. So we have great networking parties, and hopefully they're fine. Uh, yeah, this is just an example of a, a cultural marathon that we have for an entire weekend, of which this is one of the beautiful things. We have a, a theater troupe that performed for children, half Spanish, half English. Uh, a couple of the really well in New York uh, rock group performed here uh, for about two years uh, as we sponsored a young um, filmmaker who decided to have monthly film festivals here. So a young Spanish or Spanish speaking filmmaker would come, show his movie, and then we'd have a nice Q&A, and fill it up like this, and it's quite nice. And then, of course, this is one thing, members, not members, people who barely know the society, if you are a Spaniard, everybody is here um, for New Year's Eve. Of course, we are not here to celebrate 12 o'clock, but we are celebrating 6 o'clock, which represents New Year's Eve in Puerto del Sol in Spain. So we will have live feed from Televisión Española, and everybody, as you know, as you see, is complimentary grapes and cava. Uh, in Spain, instead of celebrating the moment, next slide. Uh, instead of celebrating, it's kind of strange. Even to somebody who grew up here, my father used to tell me to do it, and we'd be like, you know, five, five four, three, and instead of celebrating, we'd be like eating grapes, I'd like with dad and stuff in my grapes. It doesn't make sense. But uh, nonetheless, it's an art, as you can see. So as 12 o'clock was bringing people eating the grapes for one second for luck. Uh, we host a summer camp, which is really nice. Uh, uh, we provide a for the camp on Fridays. Guitar lessons. Uh, this is just a little flyer that we put together. And uh, just as when Spaniards come here and want to know a little bit about it, we just hand out a flower. Let's have uh, a flyer that gives them an idea. And then finally, which I know is of interest to uh, your society as well, we're going to be about the building itself. Um, here's a couple of photos. And as you can see, when you are part of the society, unfortunately, when there's not a single owner over time, as different uh, um, uh, administrations came here with styles, they, they destroyed much of our fa facade. Uh, they took our beautiful floor to ceiling, balcony windows, and replaced them with these little tiny. But we are happy to say that the reason you are here is that we contacted the Greenwich Village uh, Society for Historical Preservation because we were concerned about um, making sure that our building was true to how it originally looked. So as you can see from the beautiful build, uh, beautiful new windows that we put in, uh, those are exactly as they appeared when this building uh, went up almost 200 years ago. There is a picture in the 1970s. 
as you can see by early uh, 90s, we were replacing brownstone with a mixture of terrible granite and marble. It even got worse later. But then, then as, as six years ago, we another thing that we had worked with an architect uh, who specializes in this type of thing. We are trying to recapture the facade as well. We don't have enough money to do the whole building, so we're doing it in parts. But by the time this is done, hopefully when we're all back here in five years, uh, we're going to have that whole facade done the way used to look. Here's a, a, an example of, of when we took it apart. We found out, of course, that the original windows went down to the bottom. There's some of the original brownstoning. Okay. Uh, there's me and my daughter with our contractor uh, putting in the windows. Uh, here's an example of how the society, uh, it's tough to make ends meet. We had a choice. And this is a beautiful cupola located up, up on the top of our building. It was um, uh, becoming very unstable, okay? Uh, to the point that we were basically given an ultimatum. Something needs to be done right away. We had a choice. We could get rid of it for $5,000, or we could reinforce it for $45,000. So we opted to reinforce it. But it's not easy. So, uh, Uh, and then this is great. So we did our doors over, the doors in the front. Those are the, the doors original to the building. 21 layers of paint. Okay? Were removed. And as you can see, here's the result. And this is this room. We don't want to know what it was like when, when I remember walking in here six years ago. It was a drop down ceiling. Uh, it had most of the, uh, the pieces of styrofoam disconnected with lights from I don't know when, the 1940s, I think. And uh, you can see that uh, beautiful refrigerator in the back. Uh, and uh, it just, uh, the colors of the uh, Spanish flag, which was kind of cheesy, I have to say, were on our walls. But, um, you know, it's come a long way. And then last but not least, we'll discuss a little bit, we're at the end, almost at the end of the presentation, and that's the hopes for our future. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy being a nonprofit here, okay? As we know, I was, I uh, have three kids, I'm trying to raise in the city, right around the corner, um, and uh, uh, I was planning to put my third child into the school over here, right by the nuns, which was always an affordable option for pre, uh, pre, uh, pre, 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 pre class. Anyway, and they just closed, the nuns sold out. Okay, the nuns sold out. They're in the lawsuit right now. But why? Well, because they're being offered $25 million from their building. We get those offers every day. Every day. And the reason I'm here is because six years ago, that was how close I happened to be an attorney. I have my office right on the block, I have a storefront. Very much consider myself a community lawyer. So when the society was on the verge of closing, uh, I donated a bunch of pro bono hours to make sure it's the only. Uh, that said, uh, you know, we have our uh, issues of trying to stay uh, financially viable and still helping out the community. So I'm going to go, I'm going to speak about this for a second. Uh, I, I took a trip to Florida, to Tampa, to go to Disney World with my kids. Okay, you got to do it once, right? <laughs> and while I was there, I know that Tampa happens to have historically a very big Spanish community, the biggest in the United States. So I, I went to go see the other center. I was very eager to see it. And as you can see, what gems. So take a look at this, look at the facade there, it's a Centro Espanol. Take a look at this next one, it's a Centro Espanol. I mean, these are serious buildings. And finally, right in the heart of Ybor City, in the middle of Tampa's historic district, is the Centro Espanol, a really, really lovely building. So we're all eager to go there, and all the homes, every single one is now closed. They're permanently, they are closed, they are part of history. Okay, they are used for other reasons now. Uh, you know, uh, this one is, has its is kind of a uh, history of Tampa now, uh, so uh, it's, it's serving a decent purpose. But as you can see from the sign, I don't know if you can see it, there's a restaurant inside selling the very un-Spanish fish and chips for $9. <coughs> uh, interestingly enough, though, it got National Historic Landmark designation. So now that we have the Greenwich Village Society for Historical Preservation. I know you guys have a lot of clout. Maybe one of the ways to make the society feel maybe that we can continue and endure part of the community is a nice little plaque recognizing our 150 years 
if you're from the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, that would be an honor. <laughs> and finally, uh, I'm going to mention something that the Society is about to do. It's a risk, but we are, I think we're ready for it. The Society uh, has had a restaurant since 1920. We're one of the oldest in the city. Um, however, when at a time when most of the immigrants had moved out and the little Spain was dying, the, the restaurant and the society itself was dying. We were down from 5,000 members. When we got here, the lawsuit was against nine members. That's nine members. So they had decided that instead of running a restaurant like they had, uh, a private restaurant, that they would rent it out to somebody. It, it was a good Spanish restaurant. And thankfully, as you can see, uh, this Lolo Menso. Lolo Menso has gone on to open up four really well-known restaurants. The Socrat restaurants, I don't know if you know it, but uh, he has gone on to do very well. But his lease runs up at the end of the year. And the society is going to really take a risk, but we really feel good about it. And that is, uh, we are going to sponsor young chefs from the best schools in Spain, from Madrid, Barcelona, San Sebastian, and we are going to sponsor their leases for 18 months, have them live in the building, and we are going to create a high quality food, lower priced community restaurant. We're gonna uh, do a nice little renovation downstairs, and uh, we are really looking forward to having all of you come in for a lovely meal and nice ambiance, and uh, hopefully this experiment will work. A couple of pictures. And then last but not least, I have uh, another little story to tell. Uh, take a look at this. So we're a benevolent society still. We don't have we don't serve the same needs as we did in the past, but we still have people that come here all the time that are looking for some sort of help. And one of the persons who would come here um, uh, was an 85-year-old gentleman, I'm gonna say, from Spain, who had fallen on hard times. For some reason, some uh, government help that he was getting had expired, and he was looking for work. Not easy when you're 85. And uh, he was very smart, but he did not really know how to even use a computer. So for someone who's really looking for work, for what he knew how to do, and that was a writer, he was a journalist, without using a computer was tough. So we tr tried to figure out something, and we had asked him, we really don't know enough about our history. I'm, I'm, I hope you like the presentation, but we, there's a lot we still need to do. So we know we can do a Google search, but to get into the nitty gritty, you need to go to New York Historical Society to really find some documents and values that don't exist on the computer would be something that we thought that he'd know how to do. Well, the benevolence came back to us because it looks like, and we are not making the official change yet, but he found a document deep in the archives of the New York Historical Society that perhaps dates our incorporation back not to 1868, but to 1839. Now, we're not jumping to change the date yet. We're going to make sure that we, uh, we're going to really figure this out to see if we can. It could be because the Spanish Benevolent Society might have joined the National in 1868. If that happens, we can move it, but we need to find out. But there's another reason why we're not jumping. In two years, we're celebrating our 150th anniversary. <laughs> and we have already gotten confirmation from the King and Queen of Spain that they are coming to our visit. So, of course, if we date ourselves to 1839, they would have been 25 years too late. So, we will make sure to investigate this slowly. Um, and last but not least, I want to just mention a, uh, we have, we're trying to put together a little movie about the society. And we have a Bush sponsoring the visa of a really young, cutting edge uh, uh, journalist who, uh, uh, and, and filmmaker, who is putting together a lovely movie about this society, and she has a little teaser. It's somewhere online, she's doing a little kind of sourcing crowdfunding, if anyone wants to donate, thank you. Don't feel like you have to. But here is a, a little um, uh, narrated by me, but uh, it's, uh, it's about five minutes, and that will be the end, okay? So let's take a look. Thank you. 
Only the Hudson River piers where ships docked. The ships which brought thousands of Spanish immigrants to the city of New York. I welcomed each of them in my arms. And here on 14th Street, I formed my own family. We called it Little Spain. Secrets, and we must learn to listen. 